questions. I just wanted to like um, share about this topic of antibody conditioning and hematopoietic stem cell transplants, which I find very um, and are very interesting because I worked in, I don't know if you guys know, but I worked in a sickle cell disease lab at the NIH. And um, one of the things we worked on a lot was optimizing our clinical trials for um, HSC transplants. So um, as you guys probably know, sickle cell disease is a genetic disease um, that causes a mutation in your beta globin gene, and it causes your blood cells to make sickle beta globin instead of normal beta globin. And because of that, your red blood cells make a sickle shape instead of a normal biconcave disc. And that causes a lot of issues as you can imagine. And so one of the only treatments we currently have right now is to do a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And there's different ways of doing this. Um, traditionally, you wanna have like a full match donor, which I'll get to into describing what that exactly means. Um, but there's also experimental um, clinical trials going on for half match donors, as well as completely full match or mismatch donors, um, which are currently in the process of being put in clinical trials right now. But one of the main cruxes of the or treating this disease, I guess, is the conditioning that is used to prep before transplants. Um, traditionally, it's like you use chemotherapy and radiation to um, ablate these stem cells prior to transplanting the patient. However, this, as you can imagine, this can be quite toxic to the patient, especially if they already have organ damage. So antibody conditioning has been a field we've been looking more into, not only my lab, my previous lab, but um, the field in general. So that was kind of why I chose this paper and, um, yeah. Okay. So um, I just wanted to start off with some background as to, I don't know you guys' background on like blood and whatnot. So I'm just going to start from the beginning. So um, what is an HSC? So an HSC is a hematopoietic stem cell. It's basically um, a multipotent mature, mature or immature cell that develops into all of your types of blood cells. So on the right, I have a diagram that kind of shows you what it kind of stems into. So you have, from an HSC, you go into a myeloid or a lymphoid progenitor cell, and the myeloid progenitor cells produce what you know as your red blood cells, your erythrocytes, your platelets, your my, um, your myelocyte or your lympho leukocytes, kind of like your basophils, neutrophils, eosinophils, um, monocytes, and then you have your lympho lymphocyte compartment or lymphoid lymph compartment, which is your um, B cells, T cells, all that kind of stuff. And so red blood cells are important because their main function is to basically carry oxygen to your periphery, so every part of your body pretty much. And so you need those to be functioning because if you can't get oxygen to your periphery, you can imagine that can cause a lot of issues. Um, and platelets are important for blood clotting and um, white blood cells, as you probably know, are important for any, uh, any type of immunity. Um, each has kind of different functions. Um, and just to kind of specify for the context of this article, um, T cells are very important, especially in acquired immunity. Um, so more like specified immunity, um, they target like specific antigens and then in case cells, natural killer cells are more important in like innate immunity. Um, so they're more, they're in attacking general, in general, not just specific types of cell, um, antigens. Yeah, so that is kind of your basis when it comes to that compartment. And HSCs are typically found in the bone marrow. That's where it's predominantly found. And that's where most of your blood um, progenitor cells are synthesized. However, you can find small amounts of them in the periphery and like your peripheral blood, but you're gonna mainly find them in your bone marrow. Um, and then this is just kind of a slide explaining like what is MHC designation in a, in a HSC transplant setting? So MHCs are your human major histocompatibility complex protein. So these are a group of molecules that are found on the surface of your cells that are crucial in recognizing your cells as either self or non-self. And so um, these are important in immunity 
and then the immune um, reaction because if you have a cell that has MHC cells that are not recognized as self, your T cells will attack them and destroy them. And so basically it's really important in a transplant setting to match these molecules, which are inherited, um, so that you can have um, engraftment. And so these are, like I said, inherited from your parents. So I have a picture on the right that kind of shows how you have half of them are inherited from your father, half of them are inherited from your mother. So you can get a range of these combinations in um, siblings. And so, for instance, you could have a half match with your brother or your sister, or there's like a 25% chance you could be an HLA identical match and that you have the same exact HLA type as a sibling. And so in the transplant setting, um, you want to get as close to a match as possible because that means you're less likely to reject the graft. And so a lot of times before undergoing these HSC transplants, you type for this, um, these protein surface molecules and you'll find the best match for you, um, whether that be a sibling or a parent. Um, and like I kind of mentioned previously, even though they're all like our full matched um, protocols are also now half match, which are AKA haplo identical match. Um, so I have kind of indicated here on the right. So this brother and this person have half of those molecules match. So they're considered a haplo identical match. And so there's transplants now that have more rigorous conditioning protocols that allow for half match donors and they have been working and so Obviously, you can imagine there's are, there are a little more issues with those because you don't have the full match, but there have, they have been shown to have engraftment. Um, and so for someone who has no other, who does not have a match and has no other options, this is the next best thing. And so um, that's kind of what this MHC designation is. And so conditioning for stem cell transplants um, they vary based on the protocol used. However, traditionally for allogeneic um, HSC transplantation, it has two compartments. So just to cover my bases, allogeneic basically just means you're receiving cells not from yourself, so from a donor. Um, whereas there's a, also another option called autologous HSC transplantation. And that is normally paired with gene therapy of sorts. And so that's when you actually correct your own cells. So you were to take out your own HSCs in your body and manipulate them and then inject them back into your body. That would be an autologous transplantation. However, we're talking in this setting about an allogeneic um, transplant, which is when you have a donor cell um, brought into a recipient. And so in this conditioning, there's usually two components to it. And you have an immunosuppression component where you have to suppress the recipient's immune system to be able to accept these donor cells. And you also have to open up HSC niche space. So that's basically, you have to open up literal space in your bone marrow because your bone marrow is packed with cells. So you have to open that up so that when you inject these donor cells into the patient's um, blood that it will home to this niche space and there will be space for it to actually engraft into the patient's bone marrow. And so to combat these two um, components we have, we usually use, um, as I previously mentioned, um, radiation and chemotherapy. So chemotherapy will ablate dividing cells and so ablate a lot of things in your bone marrow in addition radiation will do the same and so you'll kind of get a, a, not only a suppression of your immune system you'll also be making space in your bone marrow to accept these donor cells um and then i kind of note um right here that there's some issues associated with these components as you can imagine you have if you have prolonged immunosuppression you can be at risk for a secondary infection um, you can have a list of issues that can arise from prolonged immunosuppression to, um, to, which would be required if you needed a longer graft and you were having trouble in grafting. Um, in addition, chemotherapy and radiation can have some pretty um, toxic effects 
including um, things like organ toxicity and secondary malignancy, which is which can be MDS, which is kind of a pre-stage to leukemia, like AML. And so um, this group that I kind of note in this paper, they are trying to, you know, um, basically strategize to uh, basically provide an alternative option to conditioning without using, without the use of radiation or chemotherapy. And so they came up with um, a conditioning regimen just for, for just using monoclonal antibodies to enable um, um, haploidentical or fully mismatch HSC transplants. And so this group um, chose antibodies to specifically target HSCs, so hematopoietic stem cells and immune cells that are um, part of the immune response. And so I note here some of the antibodies they use in the paper. And so one's anti-CD117, which is an anti-kit. And that's basically a transmembrane protein that's expressed on HSCs and progenitor cells in the HSC compartment. And so if you were to target that um, protein and knock it out, you're basically targeting HSC, the HSC compartment and knocking out the recipient's HSCs so that it can accept the donors. And then we have an anti-47, which is basically um, an antiphagocytic cell. So it's basically blocking phagos, um, phagocytosis in the, in the immune response. And then we have an anti-CD122, which eliminates host NK cells, which is another cell, natural killer cell that's, a, that's um, involved in the innate immunity response. And then the anti-CD40L, which is present on activated T cells, which is also part of your immunity response, more so your acquired immunity. Um, so like I said before, traditional or conventional con conditioning, which is kind of shown on this diagram on the right, on the left portion of it, where it says old conventional HSCT, where I have highlighted in red, this is kind of the difference between the two. We kind of see on the left that it's ablating pretty much every compartment, the HSCs, the progenitor cells, the multipotent cells. And it's not really just targeting specifically disease cells, it's targeting healthy cells as well. And so when you use radiation and chemotherapy, it's not gonna just knock out the malignant cells, it's gonna knock out pretty much any cell that's dividing. And so um, you're gonna, it's gonna lead to reduced blood count numbers and other toxicities associated with that. And then with the new selective conditioning with antibodies, you're specifically selecting for specific cells. So you're, you're in turn, like not leading to um, reduce, to toxic reduced blood count levels. And you're only targeting specifically disease HSCs that would continue to divide into disease progenitor cells. And so um, by knocking out the specific HSC compartment, you're, you're gonna basically remove malignancy um, without causing super damage to the hematopoietic department. And so I just kind of summarize here the methods that this group used to um, test this theory. And so, Basically, they used whole bone marrow cells from the from these mice in their um, in their paper, and so to get these whole whole bone marrow cells, just to give you an idea, um, they basically took bones, the tibias, femurs, hips, and spines of these mice, and they crushed them, and they got the bone marrow from inside the um, bones, and they filtered it, and they went under red blood cell lysis just to obtain the mostly the HSC progenitor cells in the bone marrow. And then in the paper when it mentions LSK cells, those are basically cells that are enriched for specifically HSCs and multipotent progenitors. So in that case, they, um, they lyse the red blood cells from the whole bone marrow and then they do a lineage cell depletion kit which depletes mature HSC or hematopoietic cells such as T cells, B cells, and they, it just basically leaves the HSCs and multi, multipotent progenitors. And then for peripheral blood analysis, um, 
they basically, once they perform the transplant into these mice, they would bleed these mice periodically post-transplant and um, analyze their chimerism levels using flow cytometry. And they were able to distinguish recipient from donor um, chimeras or donor cells through CD45 allelic differences. And so I have a diagram on the right that kind of shows um, how flow cytometry works. Um, you basically have a solution of cells and then you um, it's this machine that just basically takes it up and then each cell goes through a laser and if it if it's stained with the antibody then you're gonna the laser is gonna hit the stained cell and then it's gonna give off a signal and that's gonna show on to the um, actual sheet and you can kind of use that or the graph that's and you can use that to kind of um, quantify um, different types of cells and basically um, it's more basic explanation of it um, and yeah I just have on the bottom here that they also at the end of the experiment sacrificed these mice and analyzed their bone marrow and spleen um, for um, immune cell analysis and also bone marrow was used to find like final chimerism levels and so this is kind of the first set of results that were um, used in the paper. And so we have, they use, like I mentioned before, a mouse model. And in this mouse model, they performed an haplo identical transplant after conditioning with uh, monoclonal antibodies that I have listed here. They first started out in the beginning of the paper with a four antibody cocktail. So that's kind of like these four first four antibodies here. Um, and then they had shown that pretty much all the conditioned mice that received this four antibody cocktail um, pre, um, projected to show an exhibited chimerism in peripheral blood and also in bone marrow. And so that's shown in graphs A and B. We see in the red, the four antibody group that shows chi donor chimerism levels anywhere from 45% to 90% on the left and then with um, the graph at B, there's an average of about 25% um, donor chimerism levels. And so it looks like from graph A, that's kind of more peripheral blood. So that's gonna be in your periphery, your, your chimerism level is gonna be showing higher than in your bone marrow, which is shown in graph B, with the HIC, HSC chimerism, which you really can only really show um, by analyzing bone marrow counts versus um, peripheral blood, because like I said, most of your HSCs are present within your bone marrow. And um, in addition to that, they, they tested different permutations of this antibody regimen, and they determined that no single antibody could permit this level of chimerism. You had to have this combination of at least all four of them. And so they showed that you would have significant decrease in chimerism if you were to exclude an antibody. And um, next, they kind of use this LSK regimen where they did T cell depletion. And that's when they, um, they basically prepped the whole bone marrow cells prior to engraftment. And they took out mature T cells and B cells before transplanting into the, into the recipient. And that is because um, a lot of times, especially in haplo-identical transplants where you don't have a full MHC mass match, if you were to transplant whole bone marrow cells into a recipient, you would be not only having the HSCs you would need to transplant, you would also have mature progenitors as such, or mature hematopoietic cells such as T cells and B cells from the donor, which, would, which could potentially cause an immune response and the recipient, and it causes this awful disease called GBHD. And we've seen this in several patients who receive haploidentical transplants. It's called graft versus host disease. And so it's the opposite of rejection, because rejection is when you have recipient cells fighting off donor cells and killing donor cells. GBHD is the opposite. You have donor cells come in and eat recipient cells. And so you have basically this awful immune response where you have your donor cells coming in and basically eating at the patient. And so to avoid 
this happening a lot of times before hypoidentical transplants, we T-cell deplete the um, donor um, cells. And so that's what this LSK kind of subgroup is. We're basically depleting these donor cells of their T cells, their immune fighters, prior to engrafting them into the recipient. And so this graph on the left that's shown for D is basically showing you can get, you can still get engraftment with the LSK cells um, and four body and four body antibody conditioning. However, when they added two more antibodies to this four, an, four antibody conditioning regimen, the anti-CD4 and anti-CD8, which are antibodies for specific T cell compartments, cytotoxic T cell and T helper cells, um, actually show these CD markers. Um, they were able to get higher engraftment, which is shown in graph E, when we, ha we have an increase of about, like almost, it goes from almost 0% to almost 30%. Um, average engraftment in donor chimeras and levels. And um, on the right, we have basically we see a similar type of graph where, where we see um, LSK cells again showing like higher levels of percent donor chimerism when we use the six antibody um, regimen. And then the graph on the right, this is actually showing fully MHC. MHC mismatch transplants rather than haplo. So this is when you have a transplant that has a full mismatch. So none of their MHC molecules are matched. Our MHC um, receptors or, or proteins are not matched. So you have full mis mismatch and are able to get engraftment with a six antibody conditioning regimen. And another thing that was interesting in this paper, they tested this thing, this, um, thing called central tolerance, which is basically the recipient's ability to gain um, tolerance to the graft and um, prevent donor reactive T cells um, from forming that would induce a, reje induce a rejection of those donor, T of those donor cells. And so they were able to measure this ability for the, the recipient's immune system to tolerate the donor cells through measuring the presence of this V beta 6 chain on the T cell receptor, which is like a TCR specific type of chain that, that um, indicates whether or not these donor reactive T cells are present. And so um, the results that were shown basically showed that there was a deletion of this V beta six um, T cells and chimeric mice that rec were receiving this antibody conditioning um, and haploidentical transplants. Um, so this basically shows that in the four antibody and six antibody um, antibody regimen, or yeah, six antibody antibody regimen for conditioning, we're seeing a um, recipient tolerance of the donor graft and the recipient is not making donor reactive T cells. So T cells that would fight off the donor cells. And another um, methodology they use to further prove that their antibody conditioning could work past a HSC transplant and go on to potentially provide conditioning for organ transplants is they were they were able to harvest hearts from neonatal mice and um, they were able to transplant these hearts in um, haplo um, or mismatched mice into the it was an ear heart transplant so they took the they took the heart from a half matched donor or mismatched donor and then transplanted it into a my, uh, the other mice's, the recipient's ear. And so um, they were able to assess heart viability through monitoring um, beating of the graft. And um, they also measured troponin, I believe, um, expression, which is an important protein in your heart because it basically indicates contra heart contractions. <laughs>
Um, so here we see that, and so we see that um, we see that in antibody conditioning, you could it would allow for engraftment of donor matched solid organs um, in a haplo setting. And so the six antibody conditioned mice that had previously received an HSC transplant, um, as shown on the graph D, so the conditioned haplo mice um, were able to have a graph that persisted to survive up to 181 days post transplant, whereas other mice, control mice, and unconditioned um, haplo matched mice. So mice that did not receive antibody conditioning did not have surviving graphs. And um, additionally to the graph survival seen by the heart beating, they were able to measure positive troponin in the cardiac tissue of these mice that had um, this conditioning, received this conditioning and were haplo matched. Um, so this basically just, these results reaffirm that we can get graft intolerance um, against foreign tissue with the use of antibody conditioning. And um, another important measurement they took was they were able to challenge um, mismatched HSC transplants by immunizing them with um, a KLH um, factor which was um, basically they took, uh, they, they inserted this antigen and they were able to have an, an and produce an antibody response to make sure that there was functional immunity after these transplants. And so they wanted to basically measure the ability of donor cells after transplant to respond to antigens presented by um, host MHC molecules. And so post-transplant, um, so mice that have received a haplo or major mismatch transplant, transplant with antibody conditioning, were able to be um, re-educated to respond in immunity to antigens. And so we see a first challenge and a second challenge in the graph on the right. And so basically that means that when mice were injected with the antigen the first time, they were able to make antibodies against this antigen. However, they had a slowed response compared to the control mice. But then once they were presented with the antigen a second time and a secondary response, they responded similarly to the control. Um, so this is basically showing that you can, you can still have functional immunity post-transplant with these, um, with haplo and major mismatch HSC transplants using these antibodies. And so my basic conclusions I gathered from this paper were that um, this is a promising, um, these are promising results to show um, the potential of antibody conditioning to induce chimerism and haplo and fully mismatched MHC mismatch transplants without the use of toxic chemotherapy and radiation conditioning um, regimens. Um, this would largely expand the HSC donor pool for those who have to undergo HSC transplants and also decrease the risk associated with these transplants because a lot of the times these risks are due to the conditioning regimens. Um, in addition, although that this was promising, res these were promising results in an animal model, there are some um, unknown toxicities with these antibodies potentially in humans that we would need to further investigate to really know how this could um, work in a human transplant setting. And um, just to kind of give you guys um, a picture, so for um, st for sickle cell disease, like I said, we um, have, we were giving HSC transplants to a lot of patients. However, a lot of them lacked a suitable MHC donor. And so, and a lot of times with sickle cell disease, a lot of these patients came in really critically ill um, 
they had multi-level organ damage. They'd have, so a lot of times conditioning regimens would be, would take out a lot on these patients. And so having a less severe conditioning regimen would be optimal um, for several um, hematopoietic ma malignancies, including sickle cell disease. And so this is like a very promising field, um, not only for sickle cell disease, but for many other um, hematopoietic malignancies, um, including things like leukemia and other, other malignancies. So yeah, that's why I thought this was really interesting. If you guys have any questions, I hope I was clear. It's been a while since I've thought about this stuff. So I'm sorry if I was rusty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, thanks, Morgan. You did great.